So this is a mini lecture on the subject of Botticelli's painting known as The Birth of Venus. And I shall be discussing with you what the painting is really about. Um, this is the painting. It is a very, very well-known painting, which is why I'm discussing it. But I want to give some indication of the range of ways a painting like this can be discussed. It's a celebrated work of art. It is the uh, high point of a visit to the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. It is a major tourist attraction. It's in the biggest room and it has the biggest crowd in front of it. There's more to it than that. It's also famed as a cultural icon and a commercial asset. So you often see the image called upon for all kinds of merchandise from T-shirts to garden ornaments. And then it's renowned as a landmark of European art. But we can examine this painting in other ways too. And I'm going to do so in relation to a series of specific questions. So uh, they're all framed as questions. So we'll begin like this and carry on. Um, first of all, what is the painting subject? This isn't really very difficult to answer. Um, there's a figure of Venus, goddess of love, in the middle, um, standing in a shell, being washed up on a beach, blown there by the winds you see on the left, and welcomed by a maiden that you see on the right. So that's the subject. But then there is this puzzling question, perhaps, of why is it that so many people like this painting so much? It must be something to do with the kind of linearity and harmonious design. It must be to do with the clarity and the brightness of the colours, the use of gold and so on. So it has all those features in addition to this presentation of a beautiful young woman at the painting's centre. I might want to add at this point that the painting today probably isn't quite as glorious as it was originally, when the colours would have been brighter, especially the greens of the trees and the blue of the sky. So it would originally have been a feast of colour. Another question we might ask of the painting, and I'll come back to this later, is whether we think the painting has any faults. We might want to think about whether he could have done the anatomy of the woman better or whether he could have represented the trees more accurately or whether he could have done a more detailed or more logical landscape behind. And in some senses, these can all be regarded as not at the forefront of the leaders of Renaissance painting in his time. But I want to come back to that point in a little while's time. We can also link the painting, or can we, to um, particular innovations in art at this particular moment. Two in particular come to mind, and then the third follows from that. First of all, there is the novelty of representing the nude, the nude woman. It's a very unusual occurrence. There are very few paintings of nude individuals, nude women, from beforehand. They're usually restricted to representations of Eve, such as the one I'm showing you on the right. But what we have here is an image of a beautiful woman flouting her beauty and one who is unusually and remarkably in direct engagement with the viewer. And this is a very striking characteristic of this work. Then there is the novelty of mythological art. And this, in the 1480s, was very much a new type of painting. Um, so, a painting of the Olympian gods dealing with mythological subject. And from that, we can then begin to think about how the painting could have connected 
with mythological texts. There are texts of many kinds which are connectable to this painting. So, for example, there is a description by the Roman writer Pliny of a famous painting by the famous Greek artist Apelles on the subject of v Venus rising from the sea, which is the subject of Botticelli's painting. There are also um, passages, poems, which deal with Venus in remarkably similar ways. This is a, an extract from a Homeric hymn. It goes like this. Of August, gold-wreathed and beautiful, Aphrodite I shall sing, to whose domain belong the battlements of all sea-loved Cyprus, where, blown by the moist breath of Zephyr, that's the west wind, she was carried over the waves of the resounding sea on soft foam, the gold-filleted horai, personifications of the times of the day, happily welcomed her and clothed her with heavenly raiment. So this is an ancient Greek poem, known at the time, which has similarities with the painting, but we might want to consider just how closely or otherwise the painting actually corresponds with the story. Um, so there are many similarities, but there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Then equally, we can find modern texts, such as the famous poem by Angelo Poliziano, which again deal with similar subject matter. So I shall quote, You alone, although chaste, may safely enter the realm of Venus and love, you alone rule over love poetry, often love himself comes to sing with you, having put down the quiver from his shoulder, he, tr he tries the strings of your beautiful lyre. But joyful spring is never absent, she unfolds her blonde and curling hair to the breeze and ties a thousand flowers in a garland. This harmony accompanies your sons, fair Venus, mother of the Cupids. Zephyr, the west wind, bathes the meadow with dew, spreading a thousand lovely fragrances. Wherever he flies, he clothes the countryside in roses, lilies, violets and other flowers. The grass marvels at its own beauties, white, blue, pale and red. So again, we have a poem. It can be thought of as being similar in all sorts of respects to the painting, but the two are simply not the same. People have often said they're pretty much the same, but they're not, and there are other explanations of our painting which we might want to consider. What other factors might we want to consider? Well, the first of these would be to consider the uh, suitability of the painting to a particular kind of location. Now, we don't know what that location was originally, but there are some clues. So, for example, the painting is executed very unusually on canvas. It is first mentioned in the 16th century as being located in a Villa Medici near to Florence. So we're dealing with a transportable work of art which may well have been intended for a villa location. So who was the person responsible for having it painted? Well, it was almost certainly painted for Lorenzo dei Medici, that is, Lorenzo the Magnificent, or some close associate of his. That is why the painting features prominently laurel in the background, because the Latin and Italian words for laurel, laurel chime with the name Lorenzo. So I'm seeking to find an explanation for the laurel, and the explanation would seem to be the similarity with the name Lorenzo. As for the sort of room it would have been painted for, well, that's rather hard, because such rooms really don't exist very much in Florence. What I'm showing you here is a 14th century room in Florence of a kind where I'm proposing the painting might originally have been located. So it's a sort of multi-purpose room, richly decorated, but I want to draw your attention to some of the decorations, the rich colours, the... Um, Arcadian treatment 
of stories around an upper frieze which depicts amorous subject matter. This is, in some general sense, like the subject matter of the birth of Venus. Or here's another room in the Palazzo d'Avanzati in Florence, and I just want to draw your attention to the imitation wall hangings on the wall, which perhaps helps us understand why there is a kind of aspect to the birth of Venus which may remind us of tapestries. So it's the kind of work of art which would fit into an environment of the sort that I'm representing in these interiors from Palazzo d'Avanzati. But there are other kinds of reading we can also um, take from our painting. So we can think about the painting, for example, as a representation of philosophical ideas and as some kind of allegory. It's not too difficult to think this through. So, for example, if we know that Venus is the goddess of love, we can surely see that the painting represents the arrival in the world of Venus, or in other words, of love. So it's about the coming to the world of the representative of love. We can also notice associations which are immediately relevant with works of art of other kinds. What I'm showing you here is a comparison between Botticelli and the much earlier work by a Florentine artist, Lorenzo Ghiberti, of the Baptism of Christ. And I'm hoping you're going to agree that the compositions are remarkably similar. So there are fluttery angels on the left, there is a naked fiddle figure in the middle, and there is a kind of figure with an outstretched arm on the right-hand side standing in front of a tree. And the central figure is, in both cases, immersed in water. So the question is, why did Botticelli make his painting so like a traditional representation of a baptism? And the answer is presumably to do with the meaning of baptisms, because the baptism represents the inauguration of the ministry of Christ on uh, earth, in the world. So correspondingly, Botticelli's painting represents the inauguration of the ministry of love in the world. So you're supposed to see the similarities with a baptism in Botticelli's image of the birth of Venus, which would therefore have a comparable meaning. There are other dimensions to this too, which I won't go into very much, but if we think of the painting as representing the arrival of Venus, it can then have a political dimension. The arrival of Venus is being associated with laurel, which references Lorenzo the Magnificent, and the many flowers in the painting are then representative of Florence, the word meaning city of flowers. So love is being associated with Florence and with Lorenzo dei Medici. There are, in addition, other visual allusions that are made by the painting to the extent that we might begin to want to consider the painting to be an example of what I'm going to call visual poetry. So, for instance, the idea of the goddess of love being born from a shell is an idea which is borrowed out of ancient Roman art, which sometimes depicts the goddess Venus as being encased in a shell. And then each of the individual figure groups in the painting can likewise be equated by examples of past art. So it's quite obvious, I think, that the pose and the deportment of the central figure recalls representations of Venus in ancient art. It's less well known 
that the group of flying figures, the winds on the left-hand side, chime with representations of such figures on, in ancient Roman art, such as this glorious cup I'm showing you on the left-hand side, which was a possession of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And then the figure on the right seems to be rather closely related to representations of maidens, which you can again find in ancient relief sculpture known at this particular moment. So the thing sort of borrows from all sorts of sources and puts them together into a new configuration and in such a way that you could think about bits and pieces of the painting and make all sorts of associations both with ideas and with other works of art. Now finally I'm going to come back to the problem which I mentioned at the start which is is the painting advanced or otherwise in its style? I mean it's very flat it's very unsophisticated from the point of view of the minuteness of the representation of nature. It makes a big comparison with another work from around the same period, this time of a baptism by Andrea del Verrocchio and Leonardo da Vinci. So the compositions are similar, but the painting on the right by Verrocchio and Leonardo is all about nature, all about atmosphere, all about shadows, all about detailed representations of landscape. And in connection with landscape, it is quite interesting to note that Leonardo said of Botticelli, Botticelli paints very sorry landscapes. So taking all this into account, we might very reasonably conclude that the painting falls short of some people's ideas of a notion of artistic advancement. So that is the case. But the question then is, does the painting's style actually contribute to its subject and its merits? And I'm proposing that it does. It's not about reality, it's about a world of the imagination. It is set out in this very clear way, sequential way, that allows you to dwell on the significance of the subject and the beauties of the subject. So that is part of the point of the painting. So here we are at the end of this short lecture. And the question I hope is, do we understand this painting a little bit better than we did at the start? And the answer is that I hope we do. Thank you all very much.